Meine Damen und Herren, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, ich begrüße Sie sehr herzlich zur Mittagsvorlesung mit Professor Ian Gaff. Und da die Vorlesung auf Englisch stattfindet, may I allowed to switch into English. I mean, lunchtime lecture sounds much better than Mittagsvorlesung, isn't it? Okay, it's my pleasure to present Professor Gaff. Where are you? Yeah. Professor Gaff is one of the most important uh, sociologists in social policy and state theory in at least the English world. Uh, he was professor in Manchester, he then moved to the University of Bath, where he presently holds a chair. His main subjects were state theory. He wrote a famous book in the 70s on the political economy of the welfare state. Then he presented a theory of human needs. He was too influential with his can the welfare state compete? And as you perhaps know, my answer is yes, it can. And at present, he focuses on welfare regimes in Far East, in Asia. Professor Guff's presentation will take about 40 minutes, and perhaps we have then, unfortunately, not a very long time for a few questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Uh introduction. Is this clear? Can you hear me? Um, and uh, for inviting me to this uh, lovely and um, ancient university in this very beautiful part of Germany. I've not been to this part before. Well, I, I imagine that these lunchtime lectures enable you to tackle um, big questions, to sort of sound off about issues. So these are the two big questions. Well, I, I, can, I can lean forward a bit. Okay. These are the two big questions um, I want to look at today. It's rather strange to be talking about the future of the welfare state uh, in these weeks. I mean, just watching the news this morning and the further uh, crash in, in stock exchange values across the world. So undoubtedly, the financial crisis, I'm sure, will have a big influence on the future of social policy. But I'm not going to say a, a word about that today because I don't really understand it myself. On a, following through the implications is too much. So I want to look here at um, the, the welfare state across the world. Will European forms be reproduced elsewhere? And secondly, what are the major challenges to existing welfare states in the West and also to the future welfare states? So um, it's an informal lecture using PowerPoint, but it does draw on um, quite a bit of, of past work. So I'll take the questions in turn. The first question then. Um, by the welfare state, I mean the classic European welfare state. And this is a very basic uh, sort of catalog of basic features. <clears throat> Citizenship rights to basic need satisfiers to essential um, social services, such as education and health care, social care and to basic financial security. A big role of the state in delivering these or ensuring their delivery. Um, that social insurance remains an important a form, very important in Germany, less so in countries like Britain. Yet that this massive state um, operates in symbiosis with markets and families and that those combinations generate different welfare regimes. This is the argument of Esping Anderson, which I think is in its core elements basically accepted. And all this uh, has of course been affected over the last two, three decades by cuts and restructuring of welfare. But I believe the classical welfare states are still recognizable in Europe. Now there have been many, many papers uh, this conference and hundreds of other conferences questioning some of those features. But I want to hang on to those, those core features because when we turn our attention to Asia, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, um, South Asia, we're looking at a very different picture uh, and we want to hang on to what's sort of essential about the European welfare state. So, 
Will this model be reproduced elsewhere in the world? Now, here, of course, there's a, a long-standing debate which goes on. Um, some say no. Globalization and neoliberal hegemony will block any, any repetition of this drive towards welfare capitalism. The, the, the countries which are now developing in Asia and elsewhere and have developing capitalist economies uh, are, are developing in a totally different world to the world of the 19th century when um, welfare capitalism was established in the West. We, we, you know all these arguments. Um, on the other hand, there are those who say yes. And essentially, I think it's still a Polanyian argument um, that the progressive spread of capitalism um, commodifies labor, uh, but that labor is a, is a fictitious commodity in Polanyi's terms, and treating it as a commodity leads to a whole host of social disruptions uh, and, and uh, um, an undermining of social cohesion. And that the state or society somehow has to step in to rectify this and to decommodify labor in crucial ways through social policies. Um, and so the argument is that, uh, in, whether it's in, in China or, in, or Indonesia or, or India, at some stage um, there has to be this countervailing societal reaction against capitalism. So that's um, a major counter argument. And then there's also the investment argument that social policy can play a productive role in aiding capitalism. And, that, uh, and this is much debated at the current time in Korea and other countries in the East. So that's the debate. Now, what I want to try and put forward here is, is a welfare regime approach to this, to this question. And to ask, in a sense, more, two more specific questions. Will individual risks, um, partly innate risks um, due to ill health, partly, for example, partly new risks because of the emerging global economy, will these risks be collectively managed? And secondly, um, if they are collectively managed, um, will, the, will the forms of these follow the Western models? Now, I want to, to answer these questions, I want to um, uh, use a global welfare regime framework, um, which we developed in the 2004 book, uh, Insecurity and Welfare Regimes in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Um, and I should say that though it doesn't sound it, this is, there is a sort of theory underlying uh, this, this, this argument. So the welfare regime approach, <clears throat> the essential point is that there are very few universal trends to be observed. That when one looks across the world, um, it's the vast diversity of the countries outside the OECD which hits you. Um, China, Bangladesh, Peru, Ethiopia, I mean, just to mention those four countries are utterly different from each other in so many ways that I think a lot of the attempts to generalize and to talk about global social policy are not really very helpful. So it's much more useful to study configurations of um, social policies and social institutions across the world. And um, in the book we do this and um, we distinguish three <clears throat> meta regimes. And th so these are at a higher level, if you like, than the Esping Anderson uh, re regimes um, developed in his book, The Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism, and, <clears throat> and subsequently. Um, the, the meta regimes are, are welfare states and proto welfare states, what are, we call informal security regimes, and what we call insecurity regimes. So that all three of the normal Western welfare state regimes are encompassed in the first of these. these is, this is a higher order level of analysis. Informal security regimes um, cover a vast part of the world. 
and they have some things in common. Essentially, <clears throat> the state uh, is not very important in meeting people's basic need satisfiers and their personal security. The state is not very important. In, and, and markets are, are not are properly developed and regulated uh, in the way they are in the West. So there's heavy reliance on community relationships <clears throat> and family, social, and cultural capital to meet basic security needs. So the community and family are much more important. Um, the relationships which this um, is founded on are usually hierarchical and asymmetrical. So we still have very, we have very hierarchical relationships, often centered around a big man, uh, to, use the, to use that phrase, um, a, an important person, a man in the village or the community to, which you, to whom you turn to in times of trouble. And this, this informal security relationship results in what um, Jeff Wood at the University of Bath um, calls uh, adverse incorporation. Um, I should say that a lot of this work developed out of us in social policy at Bath, talking to people who are working in development studies at Bath, um, two very different disciplines, uh, and we just spent a lot of time talking to each other and discussing. So adverse incorporation is a sort of patron-client relationship, whereby when you need help, you go to the patron, uh, you get help, but you have to pay for it in some way. You have to vote for him, or you have to um, you owe, owe obligations in the future. Does it help if I speak there, or, or back a bit? Is it better as I'm doing? Okay. Um, and state, what state policies there are are usually integrated into this informal regime. And they're often accessed, even though they're national government policies, through the informal relations. But these, this system does provide a series of informal rights and affords some measure of informal security. So that's the basic picture of informal security regimes. And of course, one can see elements of this in European countries. <clears throat> I'm thinking, for example, of Italy uh, here. Then um, there's a, a, the extreme that there's another regime, which we call insecurity regimes, where this, this the system is so fragile that not even stable informal relationships can, be, can develop. Um, the, often this is a case where the state is very weak and where powerful external players move in and um, do what they want to do within the territory. The state is not even a Weberian state, that's the point, uh, in the sense of, of controlling its own territory. Um, and these external players can be aid agencies or criminal gangs or armies. Uh, and in this situation, there is great instability, great insecurity, um, and suffering for, for many, much of the population. I'm thinking here, of course, of parts of Africa, but it's not just Africa, which you could think of in this way. Um, for example, Haiti, very close to the USA, I think is, is an insecurity regime. So that's the basic framework. What we've been doing recently is um, a cluster analysis to try and um, see how this works out in, in practice. This is a cluster analysis of 65 countries outside the OECD using variables on public responsibility for social policy, foreign dependence, and welfare outcomes. Um, and we're able to generate clusters here. I mean, I can't go into the details. Um, which are closer to the OECD Western model and farther away from it. Um, this is a map of the world for the countries which we're able to look at this. And uh, cluster A here is the, are the countries which are closest to the Western welfare state model in terms of state spending, state responsibility and outreach lack of dependence on foreign aid and on reasonably good welfare outcomes. And cluster H is the furthest away. So these are the clusters we find in 2000. 
Now, just to comment on some of these, um, though I'm not going to look at the ex-Soviet Union and Central Europe because I don't know so much about that, and I suspect quite a lot of people here do know a lot about that, so I'm not I'm steering clear of that. So to, to f turn first of all to Latin America, here you've got um, what I call proto-welfare state regimes, especially in Brazil and the Southern Cone, excepting Chile, um, and similar regimes with, with similar outcomes in the rest of Latin America, but with much less reliance, that's the blue bits, much less reliance on social security, social insurance, as in the other countries. Um, so I think here in, in Latin America, you did have recognizable welfare states. They developed in the 1940s and 50s as part of the economic strategy. Um, they often resembled Southern European um, patterns, uh, highly regulated labor markets in the formal sector, very generous benefits for civil servants and others and for core workers, but uh, virtually no benefits outside that, a very dualistic model. Um, in the 1980s, there was a major reaction in this continent um, with the move towards what is called a liberal informal pattern. So the states, the formal bits, moved from, a, if you like, a conservative model to a, a liberal model as part of the sort of uh, export economy and the debt crisis and the rest of it. So I think in Latin America, you, have, you, you still have proto-welfare states and they are experimenting now in interesting ways with new forms of social policy. Um, in East Asia, the situation's rather different. Um, here you have a small social state um, with informal security. Now, East Asia is a gigantic area uh, containing half or a big part of the world's population. And I think the sequence of, of social policy innovations here has been from Northeast Asia to Southeast Asia and, and to China. But China is, is very, very different in so many ways because of the Maoist revolution. The East Asian miracle here continues, high growth, rapid poverty reduction, improving welfare. Yet this is based on very low expenditure on social services, very, very low. For example, in Indonesia, uh, less than 1% of GNP spent on social security of all, all kinds. Um, so this is a very interesting combination. Uh, a, a small state and um, yet very effective uh, poverty reduction policies. I think one can distinguish here between Northeast Asia, especially um, Taiwan and Korea, where real uh, welfare states have developed, um, and Southeast Asia, where there are important experiments going on, such as Thailand's universal healthcare scheme, I think the first serious universal health service outside the West, um, and symbiosis, uh, the way in which the urban and rural livelihoods interrelate, I think is a key part of the success of this system, especially in Southeast Asia and China. Um, essentially, there are jobs created in both urban and rural areas, and families can then adopt a pattern uh, of moving between the two. I better speed up a bit. South Asia, I think the interesting feature here, and I'm talking about India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, not Sri Lanka, um, is continuing very high levels of deprivation, despite the growth miracle and despite democracy. Um, public spending is low, but there's a plethora of public programs, hundreds and hundreds. I think the a major factor here is the family system, especially in the northern part of the subcontinent, and the very high levels of female uh, illiteracy, which still remains. But we also find here <clears throat> um, the sort of informal arrangements I was talking about very clearly. In Bangladesh now, there's, there's food assistance programs, there's other assistance programs for the poor. Uh, 
but you cannot get those programs in the villages in which we studied without, except by going through two routes. The first route is the local political party, not the elected representatives, the local political party chiefs in that area. And the second route is through Mastan gangs, which are essentially mafia gangs, extremely nasty people who drive around in four by fours with, with razor blades. And these people are the, the way in which you access the state provided services. You cannot get anything without going through these people. Um, that's what I mean about the way states are integrated with informal regimes. Um, but whatever the reasons, I think there's a clear uh, failing in South Asia. And then in Sub-Saharan Africa, you have <clears throat> persisting gross insecurity. There is the HIV AIDS pandemic there. Um, but in other parts, there are failing states, though not on all parts. <clears throat> but in many parts, there is no collectivization of risks, <clears throat> um, whether formal or informal, and families have to develop their own survival strategies. That's not true everywhere, but in, <clears throat> in many parts. For example, in Ethiopia, where we've been studying. So the conclusion of all this is um, that there are no unambiguous global trends, <clears throat> in, my, in my view. And there's a variety of welfare and ill-fare uh, regimes. Um, <clears throat> there are proto-welfare states in some parts of Latin America and um, Northeast Asia. There are relatively successful informal security regimes <clears throat> in much of East Asia. There are failing informal security regimes, for example, in South Asia, parts of Africa, and there are insecurity regimes. So, I mean, the basic message from this is, what are the implications for global social policy? Um, there is no single global social policy. Uh, and to try and impose um, uh, one-size-fits-all policies on, on this situation leads to very uh, strange results. Um, of course, one-size-fits-all policies were developed by, um, <clears throat> in, in the IMF and the World Bank in the 1980s and in the 1990s to a certain extent, um, but they're also found in, in other discussions. For example, I have long debates with my friend Guy Standing, who's in the basic income group, but essentially this seems to me a one-size-fits-all policy which um, would need adjusting to, to, sit, to, to, to um, fit into local context. Um, so no one-size-fits-all policies. Then, then the question, especially in the informal security regimes, is how do you develop rights-based programs, that's the essence of it, rights-based programs, um, without harming the informal supports? Because I remember here, one of these, I go back to Florence Nightingale, who was a very important hospital reformer in Britain in the 19th century. And she said the first rule in a hospital is that it does not harm the patients. It does the sick no harm. Similarly, when developing social policies in countries like Bangladesh, for example, you need to ensure that they don't disrupt the informal um, patterns of security and thus harm people's welfare. Um, so I think that's a very important lesson. <clears throat> you can't just parachute in plans. Uh, they're better if they come from the ground up. As we found in another food assistance program in Peru, um, it's called the glass of, of, of milk program, Vasa de Leche. Uh, that survived and thrived and delivers, I think mainly because it, was, it came about as a result of a mass demonstration in Lima by women um, who were concerned about the poverty of and malnutrition of their children. Uh, I think it's very important that social policies emerge from below and aren't launched in from above. Okay, well that's the first question. How am I doing? Um, okay. Okay, so now I'd like to turn to the second question. Um, which is 
And I do hope there will be time for some discussion at the end. And if not, then that we can carry on discussing after this meeting at 2 o'clock, if you're interested. Okay. The second question, how will European welfare states be transformed? Um, again, I don't want to look here at many of the challenges which are much discussed at this conference and elsewhere, including ageing. And I don't want to talk about the global financial crisis. I want to talk about one which I think is looming above all others, which is climate change. And um, this draws on a symposium I've just edited on climate change and social policy, which will appear in the Journal of European Social Policy uh, next month. Um, <clears throat> but of course, one has to then work out how this fits with some of these other threats. Um, so the climate change, the basic scenario, everyone presumably knows there's going to be a doubling of pre-industrial levels of greenhouse gases, which would mean a rise in global mean temperatures by between 2 and 5%. Um, even the lower level is, is far outside the experience of human civilization, in other words, the last 10,000 years. <clears throat> and many of these models ignore positive feedbacks. And what's more, the emissions since uh, in the last few years have actually accelerated. Um, so emi global emissions are going up faster than ever. Here's one. Oh, diagram um, of what would have to happen in order to get um, emissions of greenhouse gases down to um, achieve uh, two-degree warming, possibly um, uh, a maximum of two degrees warming from the present. Um, as someone said, it's like lemmings off a cliff. You do not find curves like this in real social um, developments. It's not going to be possible. Um, uh, it would require a 10% per annum reduction in emissions. And the only country which has come anywhere close to that is uh, the Soviet Union during the collapse of its economy in the 1990s when there was a 5% per annum reduction in emissions. And that's not exactly a model anyone would want to follow. Um, so. Uh, there's, there's much debate actually about how, how serious the situation is, but this clearly implies that both adaptation policies will be necessary as well as mitigation policies. Some argue that a four degree global warming is now inevitable. I heard a very pessimistic talk on that um, at the Labour Party conference two weeks ago. Um, so there's much discussion about the economics of all this, but what struck me is there's very little discussion about what are the implications for, for social policy and for welfare states. There's much less discussion of that. The key issue is if welfare states are about social justice, and this is about environmental justice, um, are the two complementary or antagonistic? What is the relationship between the environmental agenda and the social policy agenda? Well, here I want to distinguish four um, issues. First of all, there's the direct impacts of climate change and the implications of these for social policy. Now, most of the direct impacts will be in the tropical areas and amongst poorer countries. Um, I'm focusing here just on Europe. In Europe, the most direct impacts will be in the Mediterranean regions and in coastal areas such as the Netherlands, where sea level rises will be important. So here there's an issue for precautionary social policies, housing, new insurance costs, the health demands of extreme climatic events. These are some spillovers one might expect from the direct impacts of climate change in Europe. Secondly, there's the indirect impacts. And the one that's been most discussed here uh, in Europe is the, the possibility of um, distress migration from Africa, essentially, uh, into, into Europe. And Solana and Benita Ferrero Waldner um, were prepared a report recently which talked about a flood of climate change migrants um, in the years to come. With the usual implications for social policies, uh, jobs, social services, but on the other hand, younger age groups and challenges to social integration. <clears throat> 
So there are indirect impacts uh, to consider. Thirdly, <clears throat> there's the impact of likely adaptation policies. <clears throat> if um, temperatures are going to rise quite rapidly above two degrees above the present, um, then uh, there's a need to adapt um, to this new climatic regime. And um, here, I, I mean, I'm basing, much of this is drawn from the, um, the Council on Climate Change, the Intergovernmental Committee, uh, which reported in 2007, and which was awarded the, collectively the Nobel Prize, uh, the Nobel Peace Prize. So you've got effects on water supplies, food production, and health. There's the opportunity costs here of making settlements and buildings more resilient. There's fiscal competition, if you like, between the welfare state and the environmental state. Something to think about when, think, when considering future social policies. But it is in the fourth area, likely climate change mitigation policies, that the most profound impacts, I think, arise. Um, because uh, we're talking here about policies to reduce emissions and energy use in the West, these must involve at some stage some form of carbon pricing or taxation as part of the process of driving down emissions. Um, and this will lead to higher energy costs uh, and costs throughout the economy, as we're beginning to see from the price of oil recently. Now, um, if there was to be equal rationing of carbon, which some advocate, of course that would be extremely egalitarian. <laughs> Richer families with bigger houses and cars and lots of foreign travel would have to cut back very sharply. Um, but uh, anything less than that, and it's likely that um, lower income groups would suffer uh, because, for example, they spend more on fuel um, than uh, higher income groups, uh, uh, relatively more. And in countries like Britain, you've got these really perverse effects. 30% of the poorest quintile use more energy than the national average. How can this be? It's because British housing is so terrible uh, at, 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 at insulation. And, uh, someone recently said that uh, some uh, British families, would be, it's just like living outdoors, they said. You might as well live outdoors, <laughs> the, the amount of insulation there is. Um, so there's a lot of implications here for social policy. There's the regressive effects of higher energy costs, which will require new forms of social protection. There's new social investments to demand um, to reduce carbon emissions of housing, transport, and employment. Um, new settlement patterns much less reliance on private cars and so on. Here, again, I think European settlement patterns are better to begin with than the sort of Anglo-Saxon settlement patterns. And then there's the need for numerous policies to change consumption behavior, um, to reduce high energy consumption. Um, so there's a big agenda here, um, a new agenda and a big one. Uh, now, um, I think some of these areas might, there might be um, some symbiosis, that changes in social policies and environmental policies can go together. I've been struck by the Weizmann paradox that more equality aids the effectiveness of the price mechanism. It's a fairly obvious point, but then in very unequal societies, prices such as for fuel that discourage carbon consumption by poorer groups will do little to restrain the consumption of richer groups. Where you have astronomical differences between top and bottom earners, as in the USA, uh, the price mechanism alone won't achieve very much. But it's not just the, the price mechanism which will be required to shift behavior. Um, there are uh, other forms of um, other policies which are needed here, education, persuasion, and regulation. And here again, I think there's a lot to learn from social policy. Um, the, a titmus on giving blood, that if you, if you 
try to combine different incentives or, or um, systems of behavior, they don't always work. So moving towards monetary charges might not uh, work if they undermine solidarity. And Jackson and others say that co-production of policies is needed. I'm just illustrating here some of the interesting issues which I think emerge. Another source of possible um, compatibility between the two agendas um, is recent research by um, political scientists, two of whom contribute to the, the symposium I mentioned, um, about the welfare state and the echo, so-called echo state. Um, Dreisek and others talk about the echo, a move from welfare state to echo state, um, but arguing that the echo state is still very much weaker. And he says here, we have gazed with envy upon social policy, wondering how environmental concerns might ever come to be taken anywhere near as seriously by governments. Um, but they do find here, and this seems to be fairly firm, <coughs> that social democratic welfare states and coordinated market economies are better placed to handle the intersection of social policy and climate change than the more liberal market economies with more rudimentary welfare states. Um, so there is, um, and there's, I think there's evidence that Germany and the Nordic countries are ahead in moving towards reducing energy and carbon emissions. <clears throat> That's a long way to go, but they're further ahead. And also, there's evidence from um, another article in the symposium um, that these countries have the highest approval rating for environmental protection. So there's some evidence here that the, more, the stronger the welfare state, the more likely it can develop into an environmental uh, direction. Um, on the other hand, um, there are other aspects which might go against that. Climate change policies might displace social policies in the, in the political imagination. And it is striking here that when one looks at the EU, how quickly it's developed its climate change agenda from the Kyoto Agreement in 1997 to the uh, emissions trading system in 2005 <coughs> to the um, binding um, emission targets on all member states agreed in 2007. This is a, a rapidly changing agenda, it seems to me, in the, in the EU. Um, and when you contrast it with the, so, the social dimension, um, is there not evidence that this is sort of moving much faster and further than the social dimension? So just to end up with where to go, um, we, <laughs> We like to do this in Britain. What, what's the implication of this? Um, I mean, one is, when one combines this with peak oil and, and the global financial crisis, a sort of Keynesian solution of moving towards more programs, public programs, to reduce uh, energy consumption, to, to make houses uh, energy, <coughs> zero energy housing and so forth, um, and that this would be um, a sort of shift uh, in in the social policy uh, framework uh, that um, could, be, could happen in the future. But um, increasingly, of course, others are saying we must move towards more decommodification. We know that excessive growth, commodified growth, harms objective well-being, subjective happiness, and environmental sustainability. I think those are pretty well established now. Those. So, call, so let's call time on this crazy system. Let's shift re trajectory and move to a more decommodified form and reorient policies directly to well-being and try to decommodify consumption activities as well as labor. That would be an alternative uh, way forward. Now, I was thinking then of having a whole third section on well-being because I've been researching that recently, but that would have been too much for you. So I, I won't go to that now. It raises a, a large number of questions. But there is a lot of research now on developing well-being as a concept and operationalizing it and measuring it. The OECD has just launched a, a new initiative to do this. <coughs> 
so that instead of thinking about <coughs> uh, growth and money incomes, important as they are, one looks directly at final welfare outputs and tries to devise policies to act directly on those. Now, I think this has got great dangers, but as, as well as a great potential. But that, I think, is where some of the interesting debates, in, in Britain at least, are now at. And also in Europe, I know. Finally, going back to global social policy, um, could climate change force a new agenda uh, in the North and in the South? Because in the South, just as the development is taking place within a different global financial and economic system, it's taking place now in a different ecological system. And countries like China are encountering carbon limits earlier in their development path. So this, this leads me to think that, um, that new forms of social policy may well be developed in the South to deal with this. And in our research in Thailand, we, you do find in Thailand a, a, a long discussion um, about uh, sufficiency as opposed to satiation. It's led by the king of Thailand and by Buddhists and others. There is a quite distinct discussion going on. Do we need to follow uh, the Western growth path? <laughs> Mind you, this happens in a country, anyone who's been to Bangkok, which is one of the most capital capitalized cities in the world. But um, Anyway, the debate's going on. So I think my final conclusion is that um, there's no reason to accept simple reproduction of welfare states, welfare systems, social policies, to expect Western forms to emerge and develop in, in the South. Why should all the interesting um, sort of policy decisions have been made by Bismarck and, and Beveridge and uh, and the Swedes in the 1930s and so forth. Um, what, one can expect, I think, quite novel forms to develop in the South. And I think I'd better stop there. Thanks. <laughs> I just thought I wanted to use that as a fun. Oh, great. <laughs> just, we have to share this microphone. Just let, let me see. Wow. Just let me say, wow. <laughs> so we have 10 minutes. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not sure there's any connection between this and what I've said. But I... <laughs> Are there questions with particular emphasis on short questions? <clears throat> is that, oh, is that, is that, there's a mic coming. It seems you have a preference uh, for a welfare eco-state with uh, more emphasis on decommodified well-being. At least that sounded like uh, this to me. Mm -hmm. And my question is how in this kind of state would the needs for the masses for social security and for incomes be secured because less production, less consumption means less income from waged labor. So there's a problem here. So would this also be... Um, something that would require something like a basic income because there you sounded critical to this. Yes. Yes. Um, well, that's, this is the $64,000 question and I don't know the answer. How do we get from here to there? How do we get to a less commodified um, society? Um, as I say, in income itself does not um, generate higher levels of objective well-being or subjective well-being. Um, we know that. We also know that um, relative uh, income, however, is very, very important in both. Um, we know that, that people in, um, in some English cities have a lower expectation of life than the average person in Cuba, well, way lower. Uh, and we know that happiness and, and subjective well-being is affected by your relative, your position in the hierarchy. So, the one route to this must be greater equality, greater income equality. And I do think that um, a basic income could play a very important r role there. It would be a, a way of forcing up the floor. And I'm very much in favor of universal 
um, benefits as opposed to selective benefits or social insurance benefits. I, I'm just um, critical of, of, of the sort of, um, what's the word, evangelistic approach of some supporters of basic income that it's the solution. It's, I mean, there are many other components required. Okay. I'm, so, Ilona Ostner, Göttingen. I'm very sympathetic with your approach, but I miss the actors and religion, you know, as driving forces. You know, in talking about change, who are the actors who will... T I don't want to see my, myself. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it, please. Um, you see? Thanks. I prefer this. I want to be happy for a lifetime. Um, so where are the actors? And you don't talk about, um, you know, the state, strong state, weak states. It's also very important to explain how change can happen. So there are no actors in your approach. Um, there are no actors in my approach. There are plenty of actors. When I, we, we're, we're studying actors when we look at informal security regimes across the world. We're saying, you know, look at how the gangs and the parties organize things on, on the ground. But then look at how people are protesting this. And there are some very brave actions going on uh, amongst landless laborers in Bangladesh, for example, who have withstood beatings and so forth and have actually taken it to the Supreme Court and, and got some land taken back, which was snatched by the land. So there is, there is action. I can't really go into it in this sort of overview, overview lecture. If you mean the actors um, generating climate change policies, well, um, I guess we're talking about uh, in environmental movements and new f consumption movements across, uh, which, which we all know about, which people here know more about than me, I think, and uh, it's very important. Um, I, I don't have any special knowledge on that. Um, but they will emerge, they are emerging. And religion, did you mention religion? Perhaps you didn't. <laughs> Maxim Gatzkov, University of Regensburg. Um, my question goes uh, quite in the same direction, and I want um, to ask you a question about what, uh, you, how, what do you think about the big companies in the world? Because I think that uh, developing a new way of thinking uh, needs to somehow, well, uh, be adopted by big companies and uh, well, the other part of the question is whether you think that a new international uh, regime has to be uh, developed or you think that uh, national policies will be able to achieve those goals you were talking about. Thank you. Um, okay, so there's two questions there. Well, yes, the companies are so often ignored. And um, here I think we need more regular... There are three basic ways of changing consumption behavior. Education and persuasion incentives and disincentives, money, taxes, and regulation. Uh, and um, I think we need to think much more about direct regulation. It's outrageous that companies can sell uh, co commodities, food, and, which is actually harmful to people, which are extremely harmful and are extremely environmentally unfriendly. Why, why don't we just start to control these in various ways? I mean, we have experience in tobacco which, I mean, I think has gone too far. But anyway, in tobacco, all three measures have been used. Education, massive taxation, and now regulation on smoking in public places. Um, I think we can, we can learn from that. But, but it needs to operate on companies as well. I agree. On, on the um, international side, of course, <clears throat> there, must be, there must be international action. I mean, the basic si situation is that the Western consumption is harming the habitats and livelihoods of, of some of the poorest people in the world. And that needs international action. Okay. Hedlika Theobald Fechter. 
Uh, I agree with your ideas that you will have new types of welfare regimes or welfare states, but I have a further question. Did you uh, recognize in your research that there are some basic ideas which are underlying the new welfare states, so we can say we will have diff uh, a range of ideas, hmm. we will find different welfare states within, in different institutional regulations? Well, of course, there are. there's the whole international discourse on, on global rights, on rights, mm -hmm. which does provide a universal discourse. And just about every country is signed up to a, most of these um, conventions of the United Nations. But then, as world society theory predicts, there's a complete disconnect between the formal ratification and the situation on the ground. I mean, many countries have a complete disconnect. Um, so uh, you have to treat these universal discourses carefully. Um, so I, I think that's probably the, the major universal discourse at uh, present time. Though, I mean, the climate change is such a reality, such an egregious reality, that it, that also must force itself, I think, on. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Someone over there. Oh, you want to stop? Last order. Yeah. Come on. Um, well, the IGOs, of course, have been uh, active in, in this, and they've um, been pursuing uh, very liberal, neoliberal policies. Now they're changing their minds, and um, they're recognizing, um, and of course, they, they always say it as though they've just discovered it, that you need strong states rather than weak, weak states, and you, need, uh, and you need redistribution of income to the poor. I even went to a World Bank conference where they said we need redistribution of land. I couldn't believe my ears, but, but at the same time as that conference, another part of the World Bank was meeting to push for more privatization of pensions and so forth. So there's a, there is a battle going on. In, uh, and I think now the swing is towards more universal policies. Um, the um, Renta Basica in Brazil and, uh, and Mexico have provided important lessons um, here, also um, in South Africa. Um, on well-being and human, well-being hasn't really entered the agenda yet, but it's a step forward from human development. We had economic development, then we had human development, and now it's going, I think, onto the well-being agenda. Just stop there. Okay. Ian, thank you once again very much for your great presentation, and thank you all for this intense and disciplined debate. Thank you, thank you for coming.